Hey folks, it's your GM Jason here. It's just me right now. So I am coming at you with a bit of a special episode for this one. This is what I'm calling a book one recap. So I know we have quite a few new listeners um, since we started season two, book two of the Jewel of the Indigo Isles. And I also know that the we have more listeners than um, that have been sticking with book two and haven't gone back to book one. And I don't blame you. Book one, there was a lot of content. We had 51 episodes. So that equates to 59 hours, 14 minutes, and 7 seconds. It's a lot. What I'm attempting to do right now is I would like to give you like a half hour, maybe 45 minutes. We'll see. We'll see how long I can go, how short I can go. Um, Give you that, you know, that anime recap, that Dragon Ball Z style recap of everything that happened in book one, just to get you up to speed. And so you can pick up on references that we make back to book one. So you can, um, when we get there, uh, you can, you know, what's what we mean when we reference something. So hopefully you can stick with me if you want to listen to my voice and spend store, spend some story time with Jason. Uh, I will make this as kid friendly as possible so you can have the kiddos listen and hopefully i can make it as entertaining as possible with just one voice so sit back relax and let's do this shall we so we find ourselves in the royal court of Romplank. The party have all been chosen as adventurers to take on a mission by the Gold Crop Royal Family, the Royal Red Feathers. It seems that the Red Feathers have found half of a fabled map, a map belonging to Poppy Von Barnacle. Now, what you have to know about Poppy is that Poppy is a very, very famous pirate among the Indigo Isles. She existed about 200, roughly 200 years ago, and the town of Rumplank itself was founded by Poppy. She's known as the prototypical pirate of, you know, good times, drinking, piracy, looting, heroic swashbuckling and there is a fabled map that leads to what supposedly the legend says is Poppy's treasure now Poppy's treasure is rumored to be in a place called her proving grounds now nobody's been able to find those proving grounds because nobody's been able to find the map well the royal red feathers had one half of the map in their possession the entire time. It wasn't until, you know, some there was some uh, routine cleaning that the map in the hallway fell, and lo and behold, behind this map was an actual map that, uh, or at least half of one, belonging to Poppy. So the, the party takes on the mission. First thing they, they head to, is they head to the Temple of Many Colors. While there, they meet the head of the temple, uh, Prismatic Colvy, who tells them about what he knows, and which isn't a whole lot. He, you know, he knows the standard stuff that everybody knows about Poppy, but it's at that time as well that the party also notices that some clerics have dug up some old statues that um, seem to have been some kind of primordial 
beings. Nobody's quite sure. Prismatic Colby is seems really interested in studying these statues to trying to find out more about them because they, you know, it's no, none of the gods that anybody else knows. Well, without without um, right before they leave, Colby does take a look at the map and t- tells the party that the map seems to be warded. There's some kind of enchantment on the map. Um, he doesn't quite know what it is, but he tells the party that, you know, keep an eye on it. Well, after that, the party heads over to the academy and meets the headmistress, Uoko, who tells the party about Poppy, gives them some more information about her companions as well. Um, and then they head off. Now, as the party leaves, they run into the middle of the Glitterfest parade. This is a well, the thing you have to know about Rumplank is that Rumplank loves celebration. Not an evening goes by, there isn't some kind of celebration, and not a week goes by, there isn't some kind of parade. Well, Wanjik, the swashbuckler of the group, takes it upon himself to participate in said parade leads to the first combat of the adventure that of a tuk-tuk spell the tuk-tuks being a kind of a pest they they're kind of these frog-like creatures on the island and um, a spell is just a name for a swarm of tuk-tuks now the party rests for the night and when they, the, the next morning they wake up and they are beset upon a group of other pirates calling themselves Iron Eels. Party dispatches of the Iron Eels real quick and begins setting out to find more information. And they run into an inventor by the name of Pecky Pack. Uh, Pecky Pack challenges the party to some some ch- challenge to try to find out how exactly his um, vacuum works and the party's able to help him out and then they're on their merry oh sorry about that then they're on their merry way and they head over to the beach where Rodin the Noel monk of the group joins in on a sparring exhibition match the party then continues their investigation and they meet Demarty Texima. Demarty Texima happens to be the individual who had found half of the map but had lost it. Demarty is upset about this and decides, you know what? I'm going to join you. And joins the party as an NPC companion to track down the half of the map. The party makes their way over to the Iron Eels hideout because Demarty informed them that the last people that he saw, he spoke with about the map, happened to be some Iron Eels. Well, they head over to the Iron Eels hideout, confront some of the goons, and start making their way up through the multi-leveled hideout. They fight, they fight among multiple levels and then till they finally reach the top where they meet Malar Khan. Malar Khan, the leader of the Iron Eels. Well, Malar Khan tells the party that, hey, you know what? Sure. I'll tell, I'll let you know what I know. If you beat me in a duel, well, the party then proceeds to accept the duel with Rodin, the Noel monk, being the one to accept the duel. They climb up to the crow's nest on top of the hideout and proceed to duel, while Malar Khan, being, you know, an evil pirate, had hidden a dagger up there and proceeds to knock Rodin unconscious. Well, the rest of the party manages to 
fight their way off the rest of Malar Khan's goons. And before they were able to interrogate the party's dragon druid by the name of Rizerk says, Hey, Malar, you broke the code. It's time you die. And slices his throat. Well, the party then, not being able to interrogate Malar Khan, starts to rummage through some of his stuff and finds something about what is potentially, you know, could be the next lead. A something called the Sapphire Scale that could perhaps uh, was decipher the map. So they head over to where Malar Khan had written on his journal was the last time they saw he saw the Sapphire Scale, which was in a shipwreck at the Gasping Gipper. Now, the Gasping Gipper is a local legend known to be a haunted shipwreck. Well, they get there and try to find, what, perhaps the other half of the missing map, maybe the Sapphire Scale. Um, well, they get there and instead they find themselves in underwater combat with damn near half the party unconscious and a near TPK happening, but they do manage to survive. And it looks like the, the, uh, the missing half of the map is no, was there at one point in time because the scroll case that would have contained the map is now empty. Well, upon looking the uh, exploring outside the ship, it looks like uh, tracks lead to the writhing swamp. So the party decides to, you know what, let's go there. And they go into the writhing swamp. Here, it's kind of a mini dungeon. So they encounter a number of fleshy husks, which are essentially plant versions of undead. And they fight off a number of other creatures, only to find a local native fauna by the name of a Thylodon being sacrificed on an altar by some corrupted husks. It looks like the Thylodon is wearing something around their neck. That something happens to be the said sapphire scale. The party proceeds to encounter quite a severe combat here, manages to save the Thylodon, and decides to bring the Thylodon back to the town of Jacopo, where it belongs. So they 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 bring their they they bring the Thylodon back, only to find their way to Jacopo Town. Now, once they get inside Jacopo Town, they do have a, quite a bit of a nasty fight with a undead rosebush that, again, almost nearly TPKs the party. But uh, Procta, using fire magic, Procta's our half-elf witch, uses fire magic to quickly take care of that before any more damage is done. Smatsia a local witch, having heard all the commotion here in outside of her hut, comes on out to see what was going on, and seeing a bunch of heroes doing their hero thing, asks them for some help, because she has been casting a ritual that has gone awry. It seems that a ritual to help with sight has caused more um, given her more than she bargained for as she inadvertently summoned an eye ooze and a bunch of eyeballs well the party goes in to help her out where then she does happen to go ahead and help them after they help her letting them know that hey if you can get some of these ingredients, I can probably break the ward on this map 
and make it so using the sapphire scale we could actually see what the map is doing and not have it crumble to dust well that now that being said the party's like hell yeah let's do it so they are off to fetch some rituals first things first they make their way over to the toy makers tower there they find they fight a basically oogie boogie which is just basically a big old sack of bugs and then make their way up the toy makers tower to fi fight some more crazy toys and freaky toys and then take on the toy maker himself batarsi Upon defeating Batarsi, the party gets the first item that they need for this ritual, the Gentle Whistler. Now, afterwards, they grab some more information, they, some of the more other ingredients, and bring that back to Smatsia. So with the Gentle Whistler in hand and the other ingredients, Smatsia is able to uncurse the map. And they, the party is off to perform the actual gentle whistling ritual needed to cross the hissing chasm. Now, it's known as the hissing chasm for a particular reason. It is in that the chasm itself is filled with these predatory bugs. And the only way to cross it is to basically part the Red Sea, so to speak, of the bugs using the Gentle Whistler. Now, here's the problem. Upon casting the ritual, it needs to be maintained. But wave after wave after wave of creatures will begin attacking the caster of said ritual and that's exactly what happens we basically go into gears of war horde mode here where the party is defending the caster and as the caster is trying to get the ritual off well as you can imagine the party does manage to do it and they cross the hissing chasm meet at a couple other landmarks to power up the sapphire scale and they find themselves at the base of the shivering mountain where we will spend the rest of book one now the penultimate chapter of book one takes place in a dungeon at the base of the shivering mountain this is a natural formation where at one point in time it was a mining cave, but that mining company has since shut it down because of all the crazy creatures that they ran into that was just causing havoc and killing their employees. And the party goes into it, um, but not before facing off against a couple of um, creatures. Some, you know, some skeletons and a nasty creature known as an iron fern. And then they make their way into the mountain where they start fighting and running into all sorts of creatures. Um, so just really speeding it up. Lots of fighting happens. And then they run into a couple of really interesting NPCs. The first one is an old crag rack, which is uh, a uh, rock living rock species who was here to explore the cave because they had felt some uh, primal energies in the cave system but the creatures were just too much for one old druid to take on so they went into this sort of um, meditation um, because he's a rock being, you know, time doesn't really pass the same for them as it does for the rest of us. So he, they were in this meditation for a long time. And upon waking to the party, 
and they explain the situation. The party then goes and fights off. These creatures runs into a couple of, um, I should say, like maybe like evidence of cult activity in these cave systems. Um, not exactly. The party isn't able to quite remember what was going on. Now, Procta, the half-elf witch, did get some kind of strange visions upon seeing some of these cult, these cult uh, runic carvings. Um, something about they pictured themselves, but it wasn't actually themselves. It was somebody else, but it was still that point of view being sacrificed to this gigantic mountain-sized crustacean creature and something by the name of the Shivering Behemoth. Like that, 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 that cult name really stuck with Procta. But again, a lot of this wasn't um, wasn't like super clear to them, to her. So the party moves on further into the cave system and then runs into this elemental aura. And that's exactly what that old crag rack was looking for. Turns out that some some of that cult activity, so strange goings on, has caused a rift between the plane of Earth and our material plane. Now, after taking care of some creatures from the Earth plane known as Zuggles, the party then is faced with this rift. Now, that's where the old Kragrak comes in and says, I know exactly how to go ahead and take care of this. Um, could you help me with the ritual? Well, Rizurk, not not being one to trust a lot of people says, nope, we can't do that. And shoves him into the, into the rift. But that being said, the, the, that in and of itself, a primal druid going through the earth rift was able to seal off that rift to a, to the earth plane. So the party sealed the rift comes continues on through the rest of this dungeon now runs into a drake just a tiny house drake one without a shadow and rizark can't seem to make a save to save his own damn life and that's where the party has their first pc death Rizurk, the dragon druid, falls to a shadowless house drake. The party, realizing that, hey, we don't have a whole lot of time to mourn, says, says their goodbyes, gives them a quick burial, and continues onward, making their way through the rest of the dungeon until they run across what is um, this large kind of like crab-like creature who explains that they've been here for a while and that sure enough if you want to get through to the level underneath this you're going to have to use a sapphire scale at this door. It was a hidden door. Party manages to go ahead, use the sapphire scale at this hidden door, opening them, opening it up into an elevator that leads down. But not before they are beset upon by what looks to be a human, maybe not quite a human, cleric of Abadar. Corey's new character. Now, um, Party doesn't actually trust this character a whole lot, and um, but 
hey, a cleric is a cleric, let's go. So they head down to Poppy's Proving Grounds, which are exactly what they sound like. This entire level of the dungeon is one big obstacle course, if you will. An obstacle course that was actually Poppy's hideout, and they are able to find a lot of evidence, evidence of islands from long ago that aren't there anymore. They are able to find evidence of previous members of Poppy's band who um, Poppy was training for some reason. Why the hell have an obstacle course down underneath here? For what purpose? Turns out Poppy was looking for her next um, the next person to take on the mantle of Poppy Von Barnacle, so to speak. Because there's a lot more to Poppy than legend says. The party is able to find out that Poppy was able to use her influence in a war against a cult. The cult of the Shivering Behemoth. Now, the... And in doing so, and in winning this war, she took a weapon by the name of bum, 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 the Jewel of the Indigo Isles. Now we get to the title screen. Yes, we've gotten 41 episodes in, and we finally get the splash title screen in our movie. Turns out that the... They, Poppy took this weapon, broke it up into multiple pieces, and hid them on these different islands centuries ago. One of them is here in this proving grounds, and that's where the party is headed after, after they find out all this information. So they go through all of these sorts of obstacles. They have to go through a room full of deadly traps. They have to prove themselves in trials of strength of intelligence, of wisdom, of charisma. They fight off these parasite husks. They fight off these um, entities made of living pro mathematical proofs. They uh, fight off these training dummies. And then they get to an ooze. Yet again, another ooze. And yet again... I kill one of Corey's characters. Corey's second character, who was a dungeon cleric of Abadar, falls. <sighs> but we brought we brought back that character as a ghost for the remainder of the adventure. Because once they make it through all these obstacles, they finally get to the big bad. That of a shale charger which is a very very small now mechanically it was a large sized creature but comparatively to its mountain sized cousin I guess she was a family member whatever Procta saw in her vision it's incredibly small and they managed to fight this thing off um Pretty handily. A lot easier than they fought that ooze, I will tell you that. But as they make it through, they, they make it to what's kind of the, um, the, the winner's walkway. But there hasn't been any winner ever. Poppy was never able to find anybody good enough to take on the mantle. And so this entire, like, winner's walkway was empty. Uh. And we only ever saw these empty portraits that Poppy had planned for all of the people who were going to take on the mantle of Poppy Von Barnacle. That she had planned these gigantic frames of por for self portraits, but they were all empty because she wasn't able to find anybody. But once you make it through past the winter circle. There was one more puzzle. She had one more final puzzle. And the a party enters into this room full of statues of Poppy 
and her four companions. And it was all a matter of essentially tearing down your heroes to in order to get by it. To the the the, the point of it was to um, get rid of that reverence that you had for your old heroes. Don't hold them in such legendary status and in such high regard because everybody has their dark secrets. And that's exactly what the party found here in these proving grounds. And that and so in order to do that they had to tear down these statues of Poppy and her traveling companions. The legends, the heroes of Gold Crop Island, in order to get through this final puzzle into the gem room where they find the first piece of the Jewel of the Indigo Isles. And in a very Indiana Jones moment, as soon as that piece is picked up, the entire mountain starts to shiver and starts to rumble and starts to fall. And the party is only able to just get out in time as they make their way out of this gem room into an open area, basically a, an old dry dock, and manage to get Poppy's ship, who, which hasn't been sailed in over two centuries, but is protected by magics in order to keep it in pristine condition. The mountain is falling on their heads. They manage to get on the ship, get it, and sail it out of this mountain with the mountain in the background falling down upon them through the proving grounds. And they make their way back to Gold Crop Island to the Royal Red Feathers, explain everything that was going on. And. Just as this joyous moment of celebration is going, Syl turns to the rest of the group and is like, hey, let's go celebrate. But Procta, Juan, Jick, and Rodan have to say goodbye as they are beckoned off to elsewhere. Juan Jick, turns out, was a sleeper agent and a spy for Tessa Fairwind, the captain of... The, the leader of the free captains, Procta and Rodin head back off to Magnamar to some of the some of the bigger libraries in order to study more about the cult and about these islands and about Poppy herself. And Rodin, who is finding out that he is a knoll out of time, literally out of sync with time wants to find out more information and Corey's second character was a ghost with unfinished business and upon finding the jewel the piece of the in the, the, the jewel of the indigo isles was able to satisfy that unfi unfinished business so that ghost was able to say their goodbyes and pass off so sill in the final moment is standing at the end of the docks as two ships sail away one to the Shackles, one to Magnamar, and Syl's the only remaining character of the original party as we close book one. The Jewel of the Indigo Isles Adventure Path is copyright 2023. All logos, titles, and artwork are property of Skyscraper Studios and Roll for Combat and used with permission. Pathfinder is a trademark of Paizo Incorporated. The theme music is written and performed by Robbie Whiplash.